नमो तस्वत अर्हत so uh, today's session is special uh, because uh, in today's session as uh, sister kema has been traveling so she has moved from goa uh, to uh, ulasnagar which is near mumbai and uh, she has reached uh, around midnight uh, yesterday midnight she reached uh, there uh, next session will only be on 17th that is next saturday so wednesday we will skip a session she has to set up her place and then uh, that, uh, we, uh, we will have our normal sessions so to introduce you uh, to you pulton and uh, sara hidden uh, see uh, we will be having today a sukhita yoga session so this session is special because uh, there is aspects of uh, uh, twin which is relaxation then there are aspects of the yoga and there is aspects of energy uh, so those things have been uh, uh, symbolically mixed and uh, a practice has been uh, uh, put forth which is helping you uh, with your uh, concentration as well as uh, 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 your uh, physical and mental and energetic uh, development so uh, what uh, we have found uh, because uh, i have spoken to few of the people where uh, you has taken up this practice in uh, uh, the meditation uh, retreats which we practice of meditation when you are doing uh, this uh, sukhita yoga uh, along with your uh, daily uh, because there is this kind of a symbiotic relationship this is and uh, there has been an inspiration from twin regarding the relaxation and the movement and not to uh, stress uh, a lot and to be uh, fluid with your movements so i hope that uh, anybody who is uh, uh, over here uh, has been doing meditation uh, will uh, benefit uh, from the additional of uh, this practice of sukhita yoga and also the people who are uh, coming from the side of uh, yoga may uh, get inspiration to uh, get into Uh, the practice of uh, twin which is uh, a very kind of gentle uh, way of uh, uh, investigating uh, your mind and it is a teaching which is a kind of uh, very easy uh, for somebody to aap uh, aap swayam bhi edit kar sakte ho aap yeah. swayam edit kar sakte ho aap uh, mera awaaz nahi aa raha hai kya hello so uh, we will start the session uh, uh, currently and uh, i will uh, maybe uh, uh, put uh, if a couple of people on mute maybe uh, uh, doctor uh, major was uh, <laughs> not on mute and uh, uh, you uh, i i will hand it over to you thank you okay so Uh, welcome to everyone who's Can you hear me <laughs> okay perhaps uh, da- uh, okay yes uh perhaps uh venerable dom again to basically you might put yourself on mute as well i think there's some background noise for you as well um okay not uh, uh um if you can put yourself on mute that would be good uh be good dom again See, if I put myself on mute, uh, there is a kind of disturbance which comes. So I, I uh, reduce my uh, input now, uh, sound. Okay. 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 So, that's much so it will not. Yep. Good. Okay. So welcome everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, we have a mixture of people here. Uh, some people who have uh, uh, experience from uh, practicing twin, um, and this is uh, 
Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation. It's a practice which is either breath-based or more commonly based on loving kindness or forgiveness practice. Um, and it's a practice which uh, progressively moves us from the body into mental states. And then we've got a group of people here who are familiar with yoga and the Sakita approach. And that is about working through the body and using the body um, to support the same, the same uh, direction um, and uh, process. So this morning, what I want to, oh, this afternoon, what I want to do is, is pick up on a um, aspect of last week's uh, meeting that we had. And last week we were left with uh, this concept of unified equanimity. And unified equanimity is um, a, a state that we're looking to develop within the practice. Uh, which gives us this sense of uh, poise and balance uh, around experience, which are the building blocks of uh, the deeper meditation states. Uh, and this got us thinking about how does this work through the actual yoga practice itself? And uh, we've been discussing that this week and, and come up with what I hope is uh, a few interesting areas that uh, we can explore and discuss today. Um, showing you that working through the body um, enables us also to um, support the process of accessing uh, these states of equanimity. Yeah. So, swim is a process uh, of inquiry that takes us out of the physical body. Um, and in fact, it can take us to states where the physical body physically disappears. There's no sensation of the body whatsoever. And so when thinking about yoga, we tend to think of it in terms of a, a physical practice, you know, dominated with the body. And certain mo modern presentations of yoga can overemphasize the physicality of the practice. And we see a lot of uh, images now associated with yoga, which are simply about what we're doing physically with our body and the positions and orientations and uh, challenges and, and difficulty of uh, physical postures. And actually, yoga has a, a, a very different trajectory if we look back in, in history. And yoga uses the physical body to transcend the physical body, move into uh, an energetic, and then into refined mental states. And this is an area where, when we have a reflex about yoga these days, we tend not to see that uh, very clearly in the way that it's presented. And a lot of social media and Instagram presentations of yoga are very much around the, the physical form. And what we find is if we concentrate on the physical form, then we find that we develop an attachment to the body. And that attachment is not uh, helpful in the trajectory and the direction that we want to go in in our meditation. You know, we want to be able to work within the body and transcend the body. And anything that develops an attachment to the body, the body itself, uh, is an impediment, if you like, to where we want to go in our practice. So, um, but what's very interesting is that within the, uh, the canon of uh, the Theravadan canon of the Buddhist suttas, there are uh, many references to working with the body as an aid to meditation. Uh, and so we are intrigued as to, you know, how does that, how is that represented and how does it avoid this attachment and overdevelopment, if you like, of our, our pride in what the body can do, you know, because we want to transcend and move away from this connection with the body, which is associated with me, myself, uh, and we want to move into an environment where the body is kept healthy, certainly, because it's the vehicle we're going to use to, to meditate with but it's not holding us back in our practice. So we believe that Sakita Yoga in, in the approach that it takes forms a bridge between this uh, physicality of the yoga and the development of more and more refined mental states as part of the meditation practice. So this more, today we're going to uh, look at uh, a number of excerpts from suttas um, where the Buddha is really quite clear about the benefits of working appropriately with the body 
And I emphasize the word appropriately because it's so easy for us to be attached to the body. It, you know, it's such, a, it's such a familiar aspect of ourselves. And we can very easily identify uh, through uh, our ability or by the way the body feels or how healthy or unhealthy it feels about its connection with our mental state and this intimate connection, if you like, between uh, the feedback we get from our body uh, and the way we feel and the opposite way around. So when we're angry, our body often will go tight and hot. Um, and if we are feeling uh, upset or emotional, we might have butterflies in the stomach. So there's a somatic link between the body and, and the mind. And if you've ever injured your lower back or anything like that, you know that the state of mind that, uh, that promotes. You know, it, it just closes everything down. It feels uh, like a complete constraint mentally as well as physically. So there's this somatic link between the mind and the body. But it's something that we can use to our advantage rather than get caught in and hold us back. So one of the things that we'd like to do is explore some of the references, first of all, before we move into a practice, around what the Buddha has said about the body and, and our relationship to it. So the first of these is, and I've asked Sarah to read this, is from uh, the Mindfulness of Body Sutta, that's in the Majjhima Nikaya, 119. And uh, it starts off with, you know, a familiar contemplation of the body that we might be familiar with from the Satipatthana Sutta. Um, and, uh, yeah, perhaps if you'd just like to start yeah. with that. Okay. So we start with the section, Mindfulness of Breathing. Here, a bhikkhu, gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut, sits down. Having folded his legs crosswise, set his body erect and established mindfulness in front of him. Ever mindful he breathes in, mindful he breathes out. Breathing in long, he understands, I breathe in long. Or breathing out, long, he understands, I breathe out long. Breathing out short, he understands, I breathe out short. He trains thus, I shall breathe in, experiencing the whole body. He trains thus, I shall breathe out, experiencing the whole body. He trains thus, I shall breathe in, tranquilizing the bodily formation. He trains thus, I shall breathe out, tranquilizing the bodily formation. As he abides thus, diligent, ardent and resolute, his memories and intentions based on the household life are abandoned. With their abandoning, his mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. That is how a bhikkhu develops mindfulness of the body. Okay, so in this, in this passage, we've got this familiar refrain of tranquilizing the bodily formation. And this is an essential part of the twin meditation, but it's also an essential part of the Sukhita Yoga approach. Because as we allow ourselves to soften and relax the bodily formation, it opens up the mind to an awareness of a, a different aspect of the physical body. And we'll come on to that uh, as we go through this session. And then this phrase, this phrase which says, um, you know, uh, memories and intentions based on the household life are abandoned. Well, for us in the household life, uh, this is the setting aside. This is the setting aside of the preoccupations and the involvement and the entanglement in our, in our daily life as we, choose to, as we choose to practice. And one of the things that's a real advantage, I think, in a physical practice is that if we don't do that, the thing we notice, first of all, is that our balance 
becomes compromised. If our mind is preoccupied, we cannot come to that singleness because balance requires a different place rather than a scattered mind. Uh, and this is one of the aspects of working physically, which I feel is, is very helpful. Uh, so we'll come on and explore something of that uh, as, as we go through. Okay, so then we go on to the section, the four postures. Again, bhikkhus, when walking, a bhikkhu understands, I am walking. When standing, he understands, I am standing. When sitting, he understands, I am sitting. When lying down, he understands, I am lying down. Or he understands accordingly, however his body is disposed. So when the however the body is disposed, okay, this is all aspects of movement in daily life. Uh, and what's being invited here is an awareness uh, of that process. And if you like, yoga on the mat is simply a formalized set of movement um, that trains us to look at all movements in a similar way throughout the day. As he abides thus, diligent, ardent and resolute, his memories and intentions based on the household life are abandoned. That too is how a bhikkhu develops mindfulness of the body. Okay. okay, then we go on to full awareness. Again, bhikkhus, a bhikkhu is one who acts in full awareness when going forward and returning who acts in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away, who acts in full awareness when flexing and extending his limbs, who acts in full awareness when wearing his robes and carrying his outer robe and bowl, who acts in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting, who acts in full awareness when defecating or urinating, who acts in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking, and keeping silent. As he abides thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, his memories and intentions based on the household life are abandoned. That too is how a bhikkhu develops mindfulness of the body. So this is covering all of the movements in daily life. Um, and so any movement of the body is available for this level of awareness. And um, in another sutta, uh, the Satipatthana Sutta, it describes um, having awareness just sufficient for mindfulness. Okay? So the awareness is just sufficient. And it's about exploring what that means, because we can take awareness to any level of concentration. Uh, but what's important in the, in the Buddhist context, uh, in terms of the Satipatthana Sutta, the, the uh, foundations of mindfulness Sutta, is that mindfulness requires just enough awareness for mindfulness to be established. Then we go on to a section, the elements. Again, bhikkhus. A bhikkhu reviews this same body, however it is placed, however disposed, as consisting of elements thus. In this body, there are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the air element. Just as though a skilled butcher or his apprentice had killed a cow and was seated at the crossroads with it cut up into pieces, so too a bhikkhu reviews the same body, however it is placed, however disposed, as consisting of elements thus. In this body there are the earth element, the water element, the fire element and the air element. As he abides thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, his memories and intentions connected with the household life are abandoned. That too is how a bhikkhu develops mindfulness of the body. And so, so dividing the body up into elements, in the Sakita approach, 
uh, as you'll, you'll begin to become aware of when we work through the practice. The earth element is very important. It's our foundation. It's where we build everything from. Without a foundation, you know, you cannot build without there being, uh, you know, a, a risk of collapse, if you like. So the earth element is very important, but we use it in a subtle way. Uh, it's not uh, an over-concentration on something. The water element is the fluidity of the body. The body without tension, the body without a sense of resistance or blockage in it. So this awareness of fluidity is very important in the practice. Uh, the fire element is our sense of energy, our sense of vitality. And it's very important that we recognize that vitality, you know, although it feels like a personal thing within us, is actually a universal life force. In fact, when we develop the more refined states of meditation, uh, where we're dealing with the mental realms, we get to a stage where we have the cessation of perception and feeling and consciousness. But with that cessation of perception, feeling and consciousness, what the suttas actually describe as being remaining present is vitality and heat. This vitality goes beyond our personal identification because that's gone in uh, the cessation of perception, feeling and consciousness. So this vitality is a universal element, uh, an aspect of which is within us, and we would call it our individual life force, but it's a universal life force. And so that's the energy component or the fire component of the element. So we have the support or foundation from the earth, we have the fluidity from, uh, or the uh, flexibility and freedom in the body from the water element, we have the energetic component from the fire element, and we have the air element, this is breath, um, as a component of uh, our practice. And one of the things that's very interesting in the way that we develop this practice is that breath is intimately associated with energy to start with, but as the practice evolves within this Akita approach, yeah, the energy then becomes a factor of consciousness rather than breath and breath begins to drop away in importance, just like it does as you move through uh, the uh, rupa, rupa jhanas, those uh, material jhanas, and those stages of knowledge through the, the, the meditation practice. And because we're working through the physical body, you know, Sakiti Yoga supports us through the material jhanas. Um, the immaterial jhanas, the uh, higher jhanas, then become a, a, an aspect of practice. Uh, that's it on that phase. Okay, so this is this is just from the mindfulness of the body sutta, uh, Majjhima Karma one nine. Okay, but then there are some very very interesting little uh, vignettes throughout the uh, the, the Buddha suttas, um, where the Buddha is describing uh, the importance, um, but not over importance of the body. So, for instance. In the Anguttara and Nikaya, there's a passage which talks about walking meditation. And if I just quote it here, uh, and this is in Anguttara 3, uh, verse 30. Uh, bhikkhus, there are these five benefits of walking meditation. So that's walking whilst in uh, meditation state. And I'll give you, uh, I'll reference another sutta in a minute, which says that that walking can be in one of the Rupa Jhanas. Uh, one becomes capable of journeys, long journeys. Uh, so this is an aspect of fitness, uh, the, the capacity of the body. One becomes capable of enduring exertion. So we're able to make a, an effort for a long period. So this is about our stamina. The stamina goes up when we work with a moving meditation. Okay. One becomes healthy. And this is really important. If we're going to be sitting for long periods in meditation, one of the aspects of our own physical body is to maintain its health. Yeah. What one has eaten, drunk, consumed, and tasted is properly digested. So this is another aspect of health. 
And then finally, the concentration attained through walking meditation is long lasting. Now, what, what does that mean? Well, there's a very interesting commentary uh, to the Majjhima Nikaya, uh, or to the Anguttara Nikaya. And the commentary, and it's the um, Manoratha Purani commentary, okay? And the commentary says, if one has acquired the mark of concentration while standing up, it is lost when one sits down. If one has acquired the mark while sitting, it is lost when one lies down. But for one who has resolved on walking up and down and acquired the mark in a moving object, it is not lost when one stands still, sits down, or lies down. So there seems to be a, a, a comment there about the, uh, the durability of levels of concentration when they're developed on a moving object which I thought that was a, a fascinating reference and, uh, and it stuck out when I first, first came across it. And certainly um, in my practice, uh, a moving meditation before I sit uh, can be very, very helpful and supportive uh, in that sitting, uh, sitting meditation. And then in another area, the Anguttara and Nikaya, uh, we talk about uh, the, the mindfulness of the body uh, and the jhanas through equanimity. And here it says, when bhikkhu, this concentration is to be developed and well developed by you in this way, then wherever you walk, you will walk at ease. Wherever you stand, you will stand at ease. Wherever you sit, you will sit at ease. Wherever you lie down, you will lie down. And we're, for those of you who have been practicing twim, um, you know that there comes a time when the body feels self-supporting, yeah? that there's no tension in the body, there's no aches or pains, there's no sensation that's disturbing the mind, there's a easefulness in the body. And it's an important aspect of Sakiti Yoga that this expression and feeling of ease is also felt in the practice. And what's very interesting is that when we move away from that ease in the practice, we lose the equanimity, we lose the balance of mind. And this often comes when we make too much effort or when we make too little effort. So it's about balancing the effort. And Bhante Vimaramsi will often describe in the practice at various stages of the practice, how it becomes a way of balancing the mind, a very fine tuning of the mind in the deeper meditation states. And as the practice of Sukhita revolves, there's a real balancing required to keep the body at ease. And we make a very clear distinction about where we use the body and how we use it, in the sense that when we work too hard, we push through what we describe as the edge of tension. And that edge of tension is when the body then becomes resistant and begins to push back. And we notice the mind collapse rather than being expansive. The body compresses rather than being expansive. The body temperature goes up. The breath becomes labored. And the joints become stiff. And often we can be encouraged to push through here because it feels like we're doing work and that, you know, there's a benefit, you know, we need to push through to get more flexibility or develop more capacity of the body. But actually, in our experience, this actually contracts that capacity. And that we need this softness, this expansiveness, this openness to fully explore the flexibility that's available within the mind and the body in the practice. And coming from that is the state of mind that we have when we move. And I was delighted when uh, uh, Sister Kima and Bhante Ramamsi brought the, the following passage to my attention. Um, and that was uh, in the Anguttara Nakara again in 1183. Um, 
Walking in Jhana, my movement is celestial. These are the comments of the Buddha. Uh, walking in the Brahma Viharas. Now, the Brahma Viharas are loving kindness, that's metta, it's compassion, karuna, it's sympathetic joy, mudita, or it's upeka, equanimity. Okay, so when we're walking in one of those states, uh, my movement is divine. And then when walking in a state where there's no greed, hate, and delusion in the mind at, any, at that time, a state of no craving, and the Buddha describes his walking or his movement as noble. So here's a passage which clearly links the development of the states of jhana through to physical movement. And often we're encouraged to believe in, in uh, meditation circles that uh, jhana is not a state that allows conscious awareness it's a, a, of the outside world. It's, a, it's an absorption state. And here is a description of the state being actually connected to the outside world, you know, and what's going on. And this is what Bhante Ramsey would describe as the aware jhanas rather than the absorption jhanas. And then something that uh, Sister Kima mentioned uh, a few weeks ago in one of our sessions um, is that to remember that the practice, for a practice to be um, really productive, not only should we have a level of concentration which allows that productivity, you know, a productive state rather than an over-concentration, but also that the practice should be pleasant, uh, and, and at ease, and that knowledge should develop quickly. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the skitter practice is very much about not uh, working at the edge of tension mentally as well as physically, so not going into things which are uncomfortable, not going into challenging mental states, but resting on the edge of them so that they can be observed and seen and the mechanism of their, uh, their development understood uh, rather than getting lost into a sort of like a personal fight around you know, either a limitation in the body or a, a limitation in the mind. And then again in the Anguttara Nikaya, and, uh, and this is uh, in Anguttara Nikaya 3, 3, 7, 6, if energy is roused too forcefully, it leads to restlessness. And you can certainly see that in the yoga. When you make too much of an effort, you're, you're pushing through. You're pushing through this edge of tension. And the edge of tension creates a restlessness in the mind, a dissatisfaction, a judging mind. You know, it's not a, a mind of acceptance. Um, and if the energy is too lax, it leads to laziness. Well, the laziness is, is more of an apathy. It's the near enemy enemy of, of, of uh, equanimity. Uh, so the near enemy of equanimity is that indifference, apathy, okay? And in the yoga, it's when we backed off rather than at the edge of tension. Uh, and we're kind of not actually engaging. So the practice is all about beginning to find and stay with that edge of tension. Not in it, on the edge. And this is where mind and body come together. And this, this process of balancing is, is really about balancing the factors of enlightenment. And these are split into, if we like, two halves. Um, if the mind is feeling really sluggish, you know, then we need to develop uh, you know, the, our, our capacity to, to see what is going on, uh, our energy, and the sense of joyfulness in uh, and rapture in the practice. Uh, but if we've got, if we're overexcited about what we're doing, then we need to uh, cultivate tranquility, concentration, uh, 
you know, that collected awareness and the equanimity. And so any practice within the yoga should demonstrate in, 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 through the body this process of balancing. And then we come on to unified diversity, uh, which was where we were kind of left last week with, with Sister Kima. This wonderful uh, phrase from, uh, again, uh, another sort of from the Majum Nikaya, uh, and that was the uh, Patavila Sutta, uh, MN54. And it says, with proper wisdom, he avoids the equanimity that is diversified based on diversity. And the Pali for diversity is Nyanata. And if you look up Nyanata, it kind of goes, that one of the, one of the descriptions of it is um, all lots of variety. And so what the equanimity of diversity for us, it kind of implies, you know, there are many aspects in life where we can perhaps have a, mo a moment of complete satisfaction. You know, and there's a real calmness and, and centeredness, and it's like everything is well with the world, and there's a, a um, something beyond the tranquility. There's a, a, a deep seated. Uh, this is you know this is good, um, and you know there's these these forms of equanimity, and they and they are very diverse in life. And then there's a unified equanimity. Um, and we feel this is really talking about the equanimity of the jhanas, you know, the, this aspect of the mind that comes when the distracting elements of our mind are set aside and we gradually progress through uh, the stages of, of, of the jhanas. Gradually, you know, the discursive mind falling away, pity, uh, the rapture falling away, the joy, as it were, falling away, not in a negative sense, but then we're moving into, uh, you know, a, a, a place of mindfulness and a place of equanimity, um, which is free of, of those uh, engagements in the mind, which bring the sense of restlessness. Is it helpful there to give an example in the, in, in the yoga about where you might feel a diversified experience of equanimity and then when, when that's absent and it's more unified? Well, I suppose, I, I mean, one of the, one of the aspects that, you know, you can, you can have a lot of satisfaction about achievement in yoga. You know, you, uh, a, a particular posture feels very good or one you've, uh, you know, you, you've aspired to uh, attain and then there's that moment when it happens and, and you feel that you've kind of nailed the posture and that's, that can feel, uh, you know, have, have some aspects of that. But the, the practice that we um, encourage through this, this approach, this Akita approach, is one where we're taking the ego out of the practice so that when a posture does come through in that way, it's almost as if we're as, as surprised as anyone who might be watching us, or, you know. It's like, oh, the posture has happened. But we, but we don't feel this personal identity with the doing of the posture. And having, having it been expressed, we then don't feel that we own that experience. It's just, a, it's just the posture has revealed itself, if you like. Uh, and this is when the yoga begins to do us rather than we do the yoga. Um, and, and I think this is, is an, important, um, uh, an important aspect of, of the practice. And it's a reflective quality, isn't it, about that? Because your, um, your awareness around something that has just occurred, uh, it's like you're aware of that information after it's happened. Um, so for me, that's, that's, that, that feels like it's, a, yeah, it's an example of everything is in, in balance. It may not last for very long and then you'll, you're, you're moving somewhere else and maybe there's a more uh, gross level awareness of the body again. But when everything, um, it's like when everything feel, feel it, it's all hanging together, then there's, a, there's an absence of ownership about it. And it's, um, yeah, I mean, we, we will call it a, a, a wow moment in the practice, but it's not one where we're not, um, 
we're not in, engaged in that way that we're typically engaged in in, in daily life. So it feels a very, um, yeah, good example of how you can start to um, get a, get a, get a sense of what this is whilst you're in your physical body because you'll be going in in and in and out. Um, that's uh, I mean maybe maybe he was less less um, less in and out than say a practitioner like me because I think you you have a practice that's where there's more absence of the physical body. Um, whereas for, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm more clunky. So I'm in my physical body and then that, that becomes less boundary. Then I'm more aware of an energetic expression. Then sometimes there's this wow moment. There's like, I'm not there. And then this, the shades come back. So it might be that I'm more aware of the, the elements, or then maybe I'm right in physical tension and it, it something feels more contracted. And so then I'm starting the, 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 the process again of listening and expanding and softening and, and working towards this, this equanimity. So it's always a, a, a flow, a flow between, um, between the, the, these, these states of experience and, and states of awareness. And I think it's important to recognize here that we're not talking about having a perfect body or mm. executing mm. perfect postures because the equanimity comes around however the body is. So there may be limitation, there may be blockage, there might be injury, um, you know, there might be a psychological resistance to doing a particular type of posture. And can we come back into balance around that? Can we recover, um, come back from the edge of tension uh, or being in tension to the edge of tension, come back from a contracted mind to an expansive mind, um, you know, come back from a, a body that's held to a body that's open uh, and expansive. So it's about working within the parameters that you have, rather than trying to think that you need to develop different parameters. I, I think this is one of the, the, the very big confusions that's happened. I mean, I can't talk about for, for everywhere, but just in, 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 in what I'm aware of around, around me in, in, in the UK. And this huge confusion that um, uh, being adept at yoga means having a vast array of complex postures at your dispensation and that the development of your yoga is through this expression of enormous physical prowess, um, which, which kind of ends up with people on handstands, doing handstands on precipices and goodness knows what. Um, so th this, this is what, what I really love about this, this way of practicing is the development is all around working with um, the states of mind and the energy with it that flows within us. However, however we, and whatever age we find ourselves. So this, this is, um, this might mean a very, very limited external physical practice. It just might. Um, and that, it really doesn't matter. Um, it might mean that you have, you're in a body that's enormously flexible genetically or because you've had some other experience in your life that's, that meant you do have a, a vast array of, of practice and opening available to you. But that was, that was, that's just the vehicle. That's not the point of the practice because, I mean, I think everything that Hugh's been saying so far is, 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 is hopefully suggesting to you that these are the distractions of the body. Um, you know, we can be as attached to something that moves gloriously as we can be completely attached to something that is um, blocked and, and cemented and held in. So the yoga was never meant to be around um, forcing through those blocks or celebrating that wild expression of open flexibility. It was around bringing balance experience through the mind, through the energetic expression, so that your body is a, a vehicle for exploration. And that's why you can enjoy it as a, a child and you can, um, um, you, you can work with it as a much, much older person. And yes, sometimes there'll be, you know, even if you're on a path of 
expansion at some time in your life. Um, more physical development comes through. And certainly when I started yoga, I, I wasn't sitting like this. You know, my knees were high, my hips were tight, and my back was like this. And I didn't have a sense of energy in my body, so I was more slumpy. So there's a physical development that comes through and this isn't, this isn't wrong. It's good to have a, a healthy relationship and a healthy experience in your body. But at some point, um, we're going to get older. So <laughs> however much there's been a physical expansion, it's never going to be the, the aspect that is uh, long lived within us because then we're going to have to start to relate to a body that is diminishing in its physical capacity. And this is where the, the, the richness of, of um, yoga, if you haven't met it before, I think we're going to all meet it at, 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 at this point. Um, and then it's all around the, uh, the, the, the more um, mental and energetic development of how you're relating to change, how you're relating to can hear Sister Kima's voice now, Anicca. Um, how we're going to navigate that in a body that is changing, and and there's a there's a huge um, huge way that this can help us. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And so finally, before we we move into something which is a practical uh, uh, exploration of this, um, I just want to come back to another uh, passage that the Buddha. Described. And where he was talking about the candors. Now, the candors, um, as many of you are already aware, uh, you know, are basically the physical body, our feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, our perception, the, the aspect of memory um, and recalling and the naming of things, uh, the sankharas, you know, our habitual responses, the stories we have. Uh, uh, habits and, and emotions and consciousness. So these five aspects, uh, and when, we, when we're attached to them, they give a very strong identity of me, mine, and my own. And when we begin to work with this, this clinging, because they're, you know, they're called the Upadana candors, the, the candors that, that clinging uh, works with, you know, the, the things that we cling to, when we start to uh, address that, when we start to work with releasing the clinging, then these, these five candors, the body, feeling, perception, the sankharas, the consciousness, come for our welfare and happiness. And I think that's the important thing to remember, that all aspects of ourselves, including the body, are there to support the welfare and happiness uh, as we develop through the practice. And so hopefully, you know, from that description and connection through the suttas, we begin to see that there may be a way that we can link physically working through the body that is consistent and supportive of the twin approach to meditation, which we all know who practice it. This is an extraordinarily dynamic and effective approach. And it just, you know, it ripples out into daily life. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to show how it ripples down into the, the physical body as well. So before we go into the physical practice, uh, you may want to take a short break or um, perhaps I can just open up people to come off mute and just ask any questions around what I've said or anything that uh, Sarah has said. Um, and then we'll, we'll do a short practice to begin to connect to these, these aspects of ourselves. Uh, any questions? I now know how Sister Kima feels. <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay, let's just take a couple of minutes break. Uh, in case you, you're on that and come back in uh, two or three minutes and we'll start off and we'll just rearrange uh, the camera here so that you can see us more easily doing the physical practice. Thank you very much.
Okay, now for, for, this, uh, for this section, it would be useful to see people on video if that's possible. So if you can turn your video on, and we'll just check that uh, everyone's got enough bandwidth. And Okay, just waiting for a couple more people to come back. Is back. Okay. So one of the first things we're going to do is introduce you to a few exercises which are about connecting you to uh, this internal energy, this vitality that we have, um, which isn't discussed very much in the Buddhist suttas, but is this in vital importance in uh, and described in the uh, perception of uh, cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. That this is the vitality that's resting, and and these come from uh, uh, much more like a Tai Chi background than a yoga background. Okay, so first of all, we're going to move from our center, and the center basically is about three fingers below your navel, and about as far inside the body. Okay, and that's the place we're going to move from. So I want you to have your feet soft, your knees relaxed, and you're going to notice that my pelvis isn't going to really move, but I'm going to move from this center. And one of the things, what, if, you, if you begin to feel this, so you might want to just press your fingers here to start with. And breathe in as if you're trying to push the fingers out. Just to give you a physical connection with this part of your body. Okay, now we're going to move from this place, but one of, these, one of the things when we move in energetically is that moving from the center means that we don't move from the upper body. So we move from the center and let the body move on its own. So this way we keep our shoulders relaxed and soft. And what you're looking for is no sense of tension in your knees or your feet. So let your arms relax and move from the center. Okay, and then come back. And then I'm just going to stand sideways so you can see this a little bit more easily. Moving from the center and let the body come up and down. Up and down. So keep your body soft, keep it relaxed. Move from the center and see if you can allow your body to remain really soft and open. Okay. And then come back and punch and drop. Punch and drop. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that's working from the center reveals as you begin to get used to relaxing the body is that the freedom in the body depends on how your mind feels. Okay, so what I want you to do is now just turn the corners of your mouth down. Okay. Turn the corners of your mouth down a little. Okay. See what the message is. And then move from side to side. And notice that when you turn the corners of your mouth down, this movement becomes very much more restricted. Okay. Now try exactly the same, turning the corners of your mouth up. Okay. 
and notice that your body becomes much freer. Okay, so one of the aspects of Bantagram Ramses' teaching is the importance of smiling. And it's no different in the yoga. If we're not smiling, we're going to go into effort in our body. Just like when we're not smiling in the meditation, the mind gets serious and starts to push in the, in the meditation. And we need to come back out. So now come back and softly smile and allow your body to move free. Okay, now come back again. And this time I want you to screw your toes up really tight. Okay, so it's about as far from the bottom, you know, from where we're working as we can go. And now try moving from your center. And notice what's going on. And then soften your feet and move from your center. Okay, so now we can see that there's very little tension physically. Or oh, this association with a downturned mouth, it, you know, has an element of, uh, sort of mental tension. Okay. It reflects in our body. And this is part of what we want to work with in the Sakuta Yoga. Okay. So now, come back again. And with the end, relax your body. So... If your hips are tight or you've got any sense of injury in your body, you just don't push into pain, you don't push into tension, you simply do as much as is comfortable. Okay? Don't force yourself to be a shape. Okay? And then shake out the whole of your body. Let the body play. Okay, so hopefully your body's feeling a little bit more relaxed. And these are great exercises to do just before you, you start to meditate if you're doing a sit, you know, because it helps your body release some of the deep seated tension. Okay. And another way of working with this is to come into this center, about three fingers below your navel. And from this center, we're going to move the body in a circle. So heart's going to stay still and you move your body in a circle. Now this could feel really clunky and, and stiff, don't worry. And then move your center back. Okay. And see how the heart is staying still. Okay, now this figure of eight. We've got to we've got to develop a, a confidence around using this for support because this center will provide all of our support in our physical body if we allow it. And one of the ways we allow it is to relax our body as completely as possible. So this center now we're going to move in a figure of eight side to side. So it moves round and back. So we're having to develop a freedom in our hips and a freedom in our knees. And allow your shoulders to relax. And then move the figure eight in a different direction, in the, in the, in the opposite direction. Okay, and allow our body to relax. So why are these exercises important? Because we need to develop the confidence that this energetic center which is the same as you might uh, know it in terms of Dantian, in, in terms of uh, martial arts or things like that. This is a, an energetic center in the body, which is, activates this vitality that we need. So now I'll try and move the figure of eight forward and behind you. So as much of the eight goes behind as it goes forward. And then work back the other way. is good. Okay. Then, and slightly more challenging, is the idea of a vertical figure of eight. 
and we're going to move the vertical figure of eight up and down. Our cat is uh, contemplating jumping onto the computer. <laughs> so <laughs> just have to keep an eye on her. So this requires you to release your knees. So you're moving in a vertical figure of eight. And then back the other way. Okay. So as we become a little bit more familiar with working from this center, we can then relax our body completely. And as long as we have this center in our consciousness, okay, our body feels supported. So we can let the body release and the body comes on. And I'm just going to ask Sarah to join me on the mat here. Now, I know you're all working individually today, so it's very difficult for you to experience this. But if I ask Sarah to turn around and to have her legs really soft, hips soft, so if I push down on the shoulders, if you switch the center off, if I push down on the shoulders, you can see I can push it down. And I can feel it in my lower back. Okay. But now if I ask Sarah to come into the energetic center and keep the body just as soft, so the legs can bend, yeah? And now when I push down, I cannot move her into the floor. This energetic center yeah, creates tremendous stability and strength in our body, but it's not a stability and strength we can sense. And also to, to, to be like that just then, I, I had a mind that was very wide and open. So I wasn't kind of fixating on kind of holding something tight in my body and straining up inside, very relaxed. It was like putting just a, a small kind of um, focal point to rest here, but let everything stay open and release. And that is what gives the relaxed strength in the body. Yeah. Okay. And it's this relaxed strength that we need to develop a faith about yeah, in our practice. And we do that by gradually realizing that as we become, go through the yoga practice, we don't need to hold our body. And it takes time to develop this. It's a little bit like the meditation. It takes time to gradually develop through the meditation an understanding of the direction we're going in and the uh, aspect or uh, uh, the way the mind needs to be. Okay. But one of the things that this uh, internal support gives is the capacity to relax the body out. And I think something else that's important as you uh, learn to, to be like this in, in, your, in, your, um, in your movement is that it's going to reveal the tensions that are held in the body. And so when I first started doing these figures of eight, uh, there, there, there wasn't a homogenous flow. In fact, quite a lot of tension was revealed um, in the back and, and down around and into my hip joints. So this is something that we can bring into our awareness with a very light touch. So remember Hugh talking at the beginning about attachments to the body. It can either be um, a, perhaps a sense of pride and capacity that's unfolding, or it might be attachment to uh, a sense of limitation that we're discovering where we mentally get fixated upon that. So we're also looking to, to do something different, to be aware of the tension, but not like cement our mind with it, to stay with this energetic support so that we can have, um, have a broader viewpoint around the body, less fixated purely on, the, on, on what's, what's blocked, but also develop a capacity to be smooth and soft around it, but stay with the internal support. So if you want to add anything to that. No, that's, that's good. So now we're just going to move into uh, um, a couple of other uh, ways of being with the body, which are very helpful. So first of all, what's really important is that the shape of the body is, doesn't come out because we have a picture in the mind of what we want to do. The shape of the body comes out because it's what's required to remain in balance. So this is a very different perspective. So classic one is, is a back bend. So 
if we hold ourselves and try and lean back in the back bend, everything goes tight. The mind goes tight, your body goes tight, all the joints do. It gets harder and harder to breathe. And we go into a, into a more and more condensed and dense posture. Whereas if we come back into this center, bring our attention into our feet. This is the earth element. Feel our feet on the floor and move our center forward, keeping the body relaxed. Then our body relaxes into a back bend. Not because we're trying to be the shape, but because it's what was required to keep us in balance. So instead of trusting a shape here, you're starting to trust an elemental awareness. The relaxed mind allows you to feel and sink into the ground through your feet. And then a relaxed mind that allows you to follow this sense of energetic movement forwards so your body unfolds. And then to come out, you direct your centre back in and your body follows the movement, not that you're pulling your shoulders back up to hit the vertical. So one of the things in this practice is recognizing that all of our body is part of our balance and that includes our head. So if we think about the postures, the head tends to stay still. So then we end up doing something like this. And then the shoulders are tight because the head is held. Whereas if we move from our center and keep our mind relaxed, then the very first thing that goes is the head because the your neck is the most flexible joint in your back. So as you move your center forward, the head reduces, and then you open up the heart, and it's as if the heart is lifting towards the ceiling as you move your center forward. Now, when you want to come out, don't lift your head. That's what your instinct tells you to do. Instead, move your center back, and your head is the very last thing that comes back out. You can start to see as well there's a difference here between um, a unified movement, to use this language that we started off with, and something that would be um, more scattered, compartmentalized, diversified. That would be an example of head moves, shoulders lift, and then we come back to the vertical. The unified movement is everything moving harmoniously, harmonious movement, mind settled in the feet, mind settled in the center, relaxing the mind, off you go away, and head back in, so everything in balance. Just try that for yourself. Try not to bend your knees, try and allow your legs to be long, because as you're moving from your center, there's a growth from your heels through to your waist. And your body is lengthening up, opening up, the shoulders are soft. And gently move back. And all of the time, you're only moving to the edge of tension. So you may have some restriction in the shoulders, and you move here. And this is fine. But within the range of movement you have, it should be spacious, soft, expansive, and without tension. Keep your mind in the earth element. So, where are the elements here? The mind is in the earth through the feet. Energetic support, this is the fire element. Move from the center, this energetic center. Here is fluidity. Here is the water element. Relax your mind and your face and your body and you will naturally feel the air element. If you get fixed in shape, you'll hold your breath. There's no air element. But if you allow your body to move in balance, air element is a component of what you do. It's a naturally there. Okay. So now, we're going to do a forward bend. Okay. Don't worry if you can reach your toes or not reach your toes, it's not about that. We're going to be soft in our hips, soft in our knees, soft in our ankles. We're going to move the center back and forward. And it's a bit like being, a bit like a silverback gorilla. See how my spine is not bent at this point. Okay, so as I move my center back and let my body release, gently smile. Allow your body to move simply from the center. 
So there's no lifting of your body. If you watch me here, I move my center back and my body comes here to stay in balance. I move my center back and my body is here in balance. I move my center back and it's here in balance. So now if I move my center forward, it's here in balance. There's no lift. So we're letting gravity do all of the work for us. And this is a repetitive retraining of mind and body. So in the way that Sister Kima describes the six R's and we need to keep with them all the time. So that the mind learns to um, be with this much more automatically. It's the same approach here that it's a training to feel your feet in the earth, move from your center, relax your upper body, release the movement. And so you'll be unpicking and unraveling any automatic patterns of holding, for example, here in the shoulders, here in the neck, lower spine and the hips. But you've got to keep on task. Feet center into the spine, relax, away from the spine. And on the way, you're obviously going to uncover areas where you've got patterns of holding in your body. So part of this approach is about learning to be um, skillful around those rather than fixed onto them or pushing through them. Okay. And this is, this is an aspect of the loving kindness. The loving kindness is about having a soft relationship to limitation, creating a soft holding of that so that we can observe the limitation in a compassionate way. And that means without judgment, without criticism, without a sense of disappointment or annoyance. Okay. So the practice is in inherently compassionate if we keep ourselves on the edge of tension rather than in tension. It's so easy when we get annoyed just to push through. But then everything collapses down to a, a physicality rather than this energetic expression. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to allow the body to be able to move freely without tension. So if we move the center back and center forward, we feel the body release. And now try that with a sad face. And how much did you become aware of your physical body <laughs> rather than the energetic body? And I definitely try it with a smiling, happy face. Yeah. <laughs> Don't stay with the downturn mouth. It's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bantam Ramsey talks about, you know, how smiling brings an uplifted mind. We want that uplifted mind in the practice. So that however limited or restricted our practice is, we're able to work to the maximum extent in our body today with flexibility and fluidity. It may be a restricted movement, that doesn't matter. But within that restricted movement, can we you know, display all the aspects of balance and freedom? Okay, so then we're going to combine these two together. We're going to move the centre back and let the body come down. And then we're going to move the centre forward and let the body release. Centre back and centre forward. Now keep your mind in your feet, otherwise you're going to feel dizzy. So rest your mind in the earth element. Move from this energetic center. Keep the mind soft, smiling, and the body relaxed. Good. Okay, so here are the basic movements that we're going to use, okay, to demonstrate how the body can stay soft. And what's important to recognize as you begin to do this now, is that when you move your center into your spine, notice how there's tension in your body, which is released by letting it move. And this is the important difference in Sakita Yoga. We don't move into tension. We move away from it. So we're moving into space. And then the body stops because it's at the edge of tension. Now, if I don't let my hips move anymore and try and bend down more, you can hear it in my voice and my body's gone tight and I can feel the temperature in my body increasing. And then if I come back and find that edge of tension, 
the body's relaxed. Now, if I move my center more, I can move further. It may be the moment, yeah. So finally, we're going to just do a classic yoga posture, which is triangle. Remove your center away and let your arms float out. So notice that as I move my center away, I could feel tension, which released by my arms coming up. Okay, so now we've got this energetic center. We're used to moving it with those figure of eights and circular movements. Now we're going to move it towards the back edge of the mat. And if I don't let my body move, I can feel tension. But if I release my body, it begins to move. Now, if I've got my knees tight, that will hold my hips. So I need to keep my knees soft so the body is relaxed. So as I continue to send this energetic center towards the back of the mat, my body continues to move into a posture. Doesn't matter how far you come, but don't push through that edge of tension. And then to come out, you reverse the direction of the movement of this energetic center and your body relaxes out. There's no lifting. And then you turn your feet and you move the other way. It doesn't matter how far you go. But when you've got to wherever you go, Try moving your center in a circle and checking all of your joints are still free. This is really important. And then you're going to move your center forward and let your body come back out. Good. Okay. And then have your feet parallel and draw your center in and let your body come down. Doesn't matter how far. But keep your knees soft and your hips soft and move your center in a circle and back the other way. And gently move your center away and let your body come up. Now, when your mind is spacious and you're trusting, you have this faith in this energetic center so you can trust yourself to let your body go, then your body can move at the speed of whatever is moving from the center, whatever your intention is. Okay. So moving from the center lets the body relax. So I'm just going to demonstrate. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to demonstrate a, a, a classic sort of salute to the sun. Okay. I'm going to do it slowly to start with, and I'm just going to describe the way we work with this center and keeping the body relaxed. And then I'll do it just moving from this place, keeping my mind open and free. Okay. Do you so, want to join in or just watch? If you're happy to try a salute to the sun, you're very welcome to join in the first one and then observe the second. Okay. So first of all, your feet are together. You relax your feet, you relax the back of your knees. <coughs> and then there's this very small medial rotation Rotation in the thighs towards the midline, and that releases the tension in your buttocks and opens up your lower back. You find this energetic center, three fingers below your navel, about as far inside as well. Drop the inner edge of your shoulder blades to relax your heart. Breathe in and breathe out. Through your nose is best. And then, as you breathe in, move your center forward and notice how your body relaxes into this position. Exhale, move your center back. And we've already explored this movement. Now you can bend your knees and plant your hands. Now transfer your attention to your hands because this is the connection to the earth. Move your center away now on your left leg or right leg steps back. And then the same. Your center to the ceiling allows your body to be supported here. Okay, so you can relax your elbows, you can move your center in a circle, you can allow your body to be soft and free here. The mind is spacious. And then relax your heart, you can have your knees on the floor if you prefer. Draw your center forward and let your body come up and shoulder blades release. Thank you, smile. And then tuck your toes under and Draw your center up and back. 
and allow your body to relax out. Now, it feels a misnomer to call down dog a position of relaxation because it feels so strenuous. But then if you relax your back of your knees, relax your elbows and work from your center, allowing your center, as it were, to move upward and backward just a little. Then what you find is your body is supported without you having to hold and grip. And then as you breathe out, bend your knees and move your center away from your spine and allow your body to relax towards the front of your mat. And then exhale down. Transfer your attention to your feet. Draw your center forward and let your body expand. And exhale, come back. So this is about working from your center. Okay, now I'm just going to demonstrate keeping my mind open, keeping the body completely relaxed and working from the center. And when we work this way, the resistance in the body disappears. Because the sensation of the physical body is not there. What you feel is contact with the ground. So I could feel my toes on the floor, my hands on the floor, but I didn't feel resistance in my body. I knew the energetic direction that I was my intention around this, I kept my mind open and soft. I kept my body relaxed. And so my body disappeared. And so I don't have a feeling of, I did that. All I have is a sensation, if you like, of the body simply flowing. This, this, um, Brings back, I think, where, where some of where we started with the um, sutras at the beginning and talking about the tranquilizing of the bodily formation. And I think this is one expression of that through a physical movement form. It's not obviously the only expression, but that's that's the one that Hugh has just been demonstrating that, that yoga can give us. Um, and I, and I think that's a really, uh, yeah, it's a very powerful um, expression of the teaching. And that's not to say that the purpose of the yoga is to do it quickly, not at all. Mm -hmm. It's simply there demonstrating that the body is free of tension, free of resistance, free of the uh, blocks that come when we have an ownership of the physical body. So then, the body can move with consciousness. And then the consciousness is controlling the movement of this energy. So then intention becomes very important. And the intention needs to be very clear around what's happening. And the attention, the connection with the earth element to create the stability, but not the attachment to it. And any sense of attachment to the body would simply slow it down. And so hopefully you can start to begin to see uh, some of the threads through here from Twim in, into this, this uh, way of practicing yoga that we call Sakita, but also the way it, it can translate from, I mean, we've only been able to do a tiny, tiny little um, practice with you today, uh, but just the beginnings of how this could be relevant in daily life. Um, we're all in our daily life operating through a physical body and this is where we first become, uh, well it's not first, um, it's where we can have a, uh, a feedback from the body about what is going on. So we've got a system here which is very supportive of um, the way we want to guide our mind to then be 
find, if you like, for a meditation practice that's going to take us beyond the physical into a mental development. And we've also got a practice that's going to help us stay healthy in this vehicle for exploration and travel. And we've also got um, a way of bringing this uh, practice of awareness into our physical um, expressions in daily life so that we can start to um, start to just have a, a, a brighter, more clear awareness around when things are going out of balance in us. And I think this, this is what's going to give us a sense of, um, yeah, ease really, ease in our daily life uh, and, and a sense of balance. It, it certainly doesn't mean we're going to have a perfect uh, experience in, in daily life. I think it's, it's very much a little bit what I described with the yoga and having a clunkier practice than you. And so sometimes I'm more in the physical body and then sometimes it moves into more energetic and sometimes there's the wow moment and there's everything is evened out. Uh, but if we've got these tools to help us when we're moving into situations where tension is arising and we can land back in the earth element, recenter, find that sense of mental spaciousness. This, this is, this is going to really um, help navigate the ups and downs, the peaks and the troughs. So how does Sukhiti Yoga embody the principles of twin? Well, first of all, it's a smiling practice without that softness in the face and that openness and softness in the mind, then the practice becomes resistant and heavy. And one of the touchstones of the practice is its lightness, its softness, mm -hmm. its freedom. Yeah. And as we work through the jhana states, this is what we notice not only in the physical body, but increasingly in the, the mind as well, in working through the practice. Um, it encourages us to work with the body without attachment, because if we become attached to the body, these effects disappear. So this, we get this feedback mechanism that allows us to see how we're practicing. Um, so uh, the releasing of tension, really important. Bhantavir Ramsey talks about tension and it's linked to craving. And that craving is the I like it, I don't like it mind. And so much of the time in the practice, you know, in the yoga, we're, you know, we're invited to like what's happening or not to like it and the stories behind it, I'm not flexible, I feel heavy, I'm not strong enough, uh, I don't feel uh, flexible today, or I've never felt flexible. All of these are the stories. And we don't need any of those stories. Within the range of motion that our body has today, we can practice this way. Yeah. And, um, and using the six R's, and for those of you who are not as familiar with the six arts, they're about recognizing when the mind is not present with the object of attention. Well, the object of attention here is working through the energetic body, this impersonal energetic body, not the physical body. So when we lose that as our object of attention, we need to recognize that's happened. And we recognize it because there are symptoms come back, the heaviness, the, the breathing becomes more difficult, the mind becomes tight, the body becomes tight. These are the signs of automatic pilot, which encourage us to use strength rather than balance. And that's a touchstone. If we're using strength, we're not in a body that's in balance. So working through that allows us to see, you know, we recognize that we're not doing it. We release away from that by coming back to the object of attention, which is this energetic center. We relax the tension inside our head caused by that movement into strength or movement into, you know, that judgmental mind. Softly smile. It's a smiling practice. Return to this energetic center. Allow the body to open up and relax again. Okay. Um, so density in the body, any sense of closing or holding or weight in the body is a touchstone. And we're moving towards tran transparency transparency in our mind, transparency in our, in our body. And then, you know, 
how does circuit yoga avoid a one-pointed concentration and, and, and the development of ego? Well, whenever we're using our strength, this is an ego practice. Uh, uh, whenever we're working in balance, we have to get the ego out of the way for the balance to be there because we've got to let the tension disappear. We cannot work energetically in our body if there's tension. And tension is related to craving and we're craving is related to that first person pronoun, I. It's related to when we start to get involved in, in it as a personal practice. Yeah. Um, and so the energy flows. Uh, and when the energy begins to flow, when you begin to feel the energy flowing, you notice that the physical boundaries of the body begin to blur. They begin to change that, that strong identity of boundary. This is me and everything else is something different. That begins to change. Um, and that's a very noticeable uh, thing. And then how does Sakiti Yoga avoid attachment to the body? Well, when we push through tension, we have a strong attachment to the body. Yeah? So the edge of tension, this idea that there's this place where we can go to, which is just at the edge of pushing and striving, but is at our uh, most expansive, most open. Yeah? So even in the deepest expression of the postures, all your joints are still open and free. They don't close up. And then if you move into the edge of tension or into the tension, everything begins to close. So seeing the interplay between those gives us a relationship of seeing when the ego gets involved in the practice and when we back out from that. So this has been a very short introduction, um, but we've worked with it through the suttas to, to uh, demonstrate a, uh, a connection with the body that is consistent with the, the, the Buddhist teaching and hopefully begun to, to show how that working this way also supports the aims and objectives of, of twin meditation without cultivating an attachment uh, or and an over-involvement with the body, which we need to leave behind as our meditation progresses. So, <laughs> thank you for, for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, we'd be delighted to, to field those and answer them. Or uh, Bhante Vimramsi can provide you with our email address. And, uh, uh, oh, don't, sorry, <laughs> Bhante Dhammukavesi can uh, provide you with our email address uh, and you're very welcome to, to contact us that way. Um, and we're very happy to answer any questions that you have right now. So um, over to you. Yeah, this was a kind of a, a, a very kind of a informative session which we had and uh, I, I am kind of uh, uh, looking at it from a different angle. I have uh, 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 traditionally I have not been kind of in my life also uh, uh, attracted to exercise but uh, I have been kind of inspired uh, by what uh, you have kind of uh, given a connection with the suttas and uh, with the twin. So I'm kind of uh, inspired. I, uh, I will uh, like to ask uh, David also to keep this uh, session uh, as uh, on the Bhante Vivarasi channel also. And we'll keep this recording on uh, uh, Sister Khema's channel, uh, Reverend Kanti Khema's channel. Uh, so more people can uh, kind of benefit so this is uh, something uh, I think uh, we can uh, have an ongoing thing wherever possible. Uh, we, we may have a, a, another session. Uh, you may uh, go from a different angle or in different aspect uh, of this practice. So I'm very thankful that you came uh, and uh, shared your experiences and uh, uh, what you have discovered uh, and uh, brought together and it's kind of a very uh, uh, complementary fashion uh, those aspects of uh, energy of uh, uh, collectedness and the physical aspects of it and not uh, uh, to go on the edge of tension is the kind of uh, the main thing that not to kind of go beyond that is a kind of a balance 
not to be mm-hmm. too uh, uh, tensionless or not to be too much of tension, but just to have that balance. The middle path uh, is uh, kind of very easy for me. So I'm very happy. And uh, 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 if uh, somebody uh, wants to ask a question or anything, do you want to uh, do it now? Is is there somebody who wants to? We can do it now. We've, we've got about 15 minutes that we've got uh, uh, allocated. So we're happy to field questions. But also to point out that we did an earlier session um, a, a couple of months ago, and that has a fuller practice. So this was very much to put it in the context of TWIM meditation and Buddha's teaching. And the previous recording, which is also available on the Assisted Humus channel, um, it gives you, uh, I think it's about a, a half hour or 35 minute uh, practice. So um, by all means, go, go to that, um, listen to this again, perhaps, and watch that one. Um, and then um, we're very happy to um, organize or arrange a suitable uh, uh, teaching slot if people would like to practice this uh, consistently during the week. Um, uh, that's, that's more uh, suitable for uh, uh, Indian time and uh, uh, the, you know, the time zones out in Asia. So um, uh, all of that is possible. And if you've got any questions, very happy to, to answer them. Yes, uh, yeah. Deepa. Yeah, yeah. Um, w- would you suggest any exercises that can help us strengthen our back? Uh, well, all of these exercises mm-hmm. are very good um, because once you cultivate the capacity to work energetically, um, then you begin to, you know, one of the things about lower back pain is uh, the anticipation of the pain is often a, a, a factor. So we tense. And then because we tense, the movement that triggers pain occurs much earlier in the range of movement. So as we become more familiar with working energetically, we're able to keep the body more relaxed, but supported. So then the range of movement uh, begins to increase, um, you know, um, rather than uh, be uh, restricted by by the fear and tension of of lower back pain. But, uh, you know, working specifically around certain injuries, uh, we would uh, either do directly one-to-one or or that. But in principle, working energetically gives you a much greater range of movement. It's a much kinder way of working with your body. So if one is, uh, for instance, I had a back injury and I'm still recovering from it. It's been three, four years and uh, uh, um, the back still feels impacted. So how would I go about cultivating yoga in a gentle way? Um, you know, how much to push myself and how, you know, how do well, I know? Yeah. Well, the answer is not to push yourself. When you work energetically, you don't push. Okay. You work to the full range of movement before tension arises. Um, and one of the things that you could do, um, we do have a, um, we do have some recordings available of some healing classes that we've done. Um, and if that's something that you'd like to explore or even attend one of the healing classes, um, we do one at 9.30 in the morning here. So that would be um, uh, 1.30 in the afternoon uh, for you. I don't know if that would work for your time today. But that's that's on a that's on a Tuesday morning, um, so that might be something to join in and uh, and come along and, and have a look at that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? What is your opinion about uh, Surya Namaskar? Ah, uh, Surya Namaskar, the salute to the sun. Um, uh, the salute to the sun is uh, is. A, it's a very good sequence of movements uh, to develop a healthy body. Um, but they are, um, if you're not careful, they, they encourage you to be impatient with your body because you know you feel you need to get your hands onto the floor in a forward bend. You need to feel that you have to hold yourself in, in plank posture you know, and this sort of thing. Um, so there are ways of doing Surya Namaskar which are very much kinder and easier for those who feel more restricted in their body. Um, so the demonstration I gave here was, was just a cursory one to show you something that uh, uh, you may have been familiar with or seen. 
Um, but there are ways of working with uh, Surya Namaskar which um, gradually allow you to open up your body uh, until it feels capable um, and more confident uh, to do perhaps the expression that we showed you today. Thank you. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yes, Selena. Oh, you and Sarah, thank you. That's been really, really good as a um, one of your students and your um, trained teachers. Um, but what I was interested in is um, the sutras that you mentioned. Is it possible just to give the name so we can reference it? Perhaps some of the other people here are a bit more familiar with that. Uh, yes, um, I've, I've got references for, for all of them. So what I can, uh, I can do is um, if, uh, uh, if you either message me directly or via Vikadama uh, Gavesi, if you want the references to the, the uh, uh, sources that I quoted, I can, send you a, I can send you a list of those. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you for finding the time to uh, join us today. We've been together for nearly, nearly two hours, so I really appreciate finding that slot on a, on a Saturday. And, uh, and I hope uh, it's been helpful and encourages you to um, work in a way which is consistent with, uh, with the meditation aspirations aspirations um, uh, and, and brings, you know, uh, these benefits of health and balance to, uh, to the mind and the body, because I think that's a very important part of being able to sustain uh, a meditation practice over years, but also be able to, ex to sustain a meditation practice which may require you to sit for, you know, three, four or five hours uh, at, a at a time and, you know, not uh, um, uh, create problems in the body uh, around that. So thank you very much indeed. Oh, and please, um, uh, the teaching on this this session is completely free, but we are uh, very much aware that uh, uh, Dana would be appreciated towards uh, the monastics who support this this uh, this teaching approach, and particularly Bhikkhu uh, uh, Gavesi and Sister Kima. Um, and so those of you who uh, would um, like to uh, contribute uh, some sort of dana, that's a donation, then either please contact uh, the Gudama Gavesi or uh, myself and I will just forward uh, the, the payment details that goes directly to them. And this is to sustain them in terms of their, their living costs and uh, medicines and that because for those of you who are not familiar, um, then, uh, you know, the monastics, uh, you know, do not uh, um, uh, receive anything other than by donation uh, to sustain their, their life and their teaching. Uh, any further questions? Okay, so over to you, uh, Vigodong Gamesi. Okay, uh, so we will uh, share merit uh, for people who don't uh, uh, kind of recognize this. It is just a way of uh, uh, saying that anything uh, when uh, a good aspect has been done, a good action has been done, uh, then uh, there is a merit to be earned uh, from that good action. And when we share the merit, there is also merit uh, for sharing the merit. So it is kind of a multiplier effect of uh, sharing a merit. And that is the reason we end uh, the programs with a sharing of merit. So uh, uh, this is for all of uh, us who participated and for uh, Sarah and uh, you who have uh, given their time. So this is for everybody. Uh, so we'll just uh, share this merit and end the uh, session. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fearless uh, failures be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have acqu thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. 
Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Okay. Thank you very much.